Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and we've been taking a lot of Fourier transforms. So today I'm going to take transforms of a couple of boxcars and show that these transform into things that are called sync functions. On the left, we'll have a time domain function of length L that's centered around zero. And on the right, we'll have a frequency domain function going from minus omega naught to omega naught. So on the left, I'm going to take a Fourier transform. And on the right, I'm going to take an inverse Fourier transform, which you'll sometimes see with this strange little odd minus one notation here. Here, this doesn't mean take a transform and take its reciprocal. It means take an inverse transform. It's a fairly unfortunate and confusing choice of notation that has unfortunately stuck. I'll try to run both of these derivations in parallel. On the right, we were taking an inverse transform, so I have to be careful not to forget the 1 over 2 pi. And let me go ahead and just write the various functions in here. So I'm just going to draw them. Now, you can, of course, write these using unit step functions, but that expression with the unit step functions isn't really any more informative than the graph is and can, in fact, even obscure a bit what's going on. So with the forward transform, I'm multiplying by e to the minus j omega t. With the inverse transform, I'm multiplying by e to the j omega t. And with the forward transform, we integrate against time. And the inverse transform, we integrate against omega. This block here is chopping off the function at minus l over 2 and l over 2. And the easiest way to incorporate that is to just put it into the limits of the integral. So we'll be integrating from minus L over 2 to L over 2, e to the minus j omega t dt. If I wanted to be pedantic, I could put the number 1 here, but that wouldn't really help anything. So we'll just go ahead and leave that out. On the right, let me be careful not to forget the 1 over 2 pi, which I will tend to do. Here the limits are now going from minus omega naught to omega naught. And we have e to the plus j omega t d omega. Okay, so doing the integral, I'll have a minus j omega in the denominator. And in the numerator, I'll have e to the minus j omega, plugging in L over 2 for the upper limit and plugging in minus L over 2 for the lower limit. And that minus there will cancel with this minus, giving me a plus j omega L over 2. Then here on the right, I'll have j t in the denominator because the j and t here is a constant with respect to omega. And then I'll plug in e to the j omega naught t for the upper limit. And then the lower limit will give me an e to the minus j omega naught t. So on the left, let me rewrite this slightly. What I'll do is I'll incorporate the minus sign here by flipping the order of the terms in the numerator. So I'll write this as e to the j omega L over 2 minus e to the minus j omega L over 2. And now this is a thing that should get our attention. I have e to the j stuff minus e to the minus j stuff. And on the right here, I have e to the j stuff minus e to the minus j stuff. So this, along with the fact that there's a j in the denominator here, should get my attention. We can replace these using sine functions using the inverse Euler's formula. So on the right, this works right away because I have a 2j sitting here in the denominator. Ooh, before I write anything, let me not forget the pi that's sitting here in front. I'll have sine omega naught t over pi t. I don't need the 2j anymore because that was part of combining with these exponent terms to form the sign. Now on the right, I need to play with this expression a little bit more in order to be able to write it as a sine function. Normally what I would do is I would put a 2 up here and then I would put a 2 in the denominator so I can use 2j on this to create the sign. I'm going to do basically that, but I'll write it slightly differently. I'm going to write it as 2 divided by 2 down here, and you'll see why in a second. I'll write this as sine L omega over 2, and then in the denominator, I'll write omega over 2. Again, here the j and the 2 combine with the exponents here to give me the sine. And what's nice about this is I have a similar structure. I have omega over 2 here and omega over 2 here. So these things have a special name. These are called sync functions. You'll often find textbooks define sync of blah, blah, blah equals some stuff. They'll all have this sign stuff over stuff kind of form, but they'll have 
all sorts of different weird variations in here that can cause a good deal of confusion, particularly because different textbooks will use different definitions of quote-unquote sync. And sometimes those textbook definitions won't match up with the way MATLAB or some other computer program defines sync. So instead of writing S-I-N-C, I prefer to just go ahead and spell out sign blah, blah, blah over blah, blah, blah as needed to avoid confusion. I've rearranged things into a nice little Fourier transform table. And just like we've seen before with impulse functions and sinusoids, we have a nice quasi-symmetry going on here. Sinks transform into boxcars and boxcars transform into sinks. So in addition to the usual differences of pluses and minuses or one over two pi's or whatever, there's a slight difference in the style of these formulas because I formulated the original rectangles differently. Here we have something of length L that is going from minus L over two to L over two. Whereas when I did this in the frequency domain, I made a block here of length to a mega naught going from minus a mega naught to a mega naught. This is reflective of the way that we tend to use these transforms in engineering. A mathematician may view these as basically being the same thing, but the way we experience these as engineers is different. The way we would usually use a boxcar function in time is to take some function and multiply it by a boxcar to indicate that we have some sort of base function like a sinusoid and that we're zeroing out things outside a particular region that we're looking at. That's often called windowing. On the other hand, when we use boxcar type functions in the frequency domain, this is usually representing a low pass filter function that's chopping off frequencies above a mega naught. So that's why we notated these things slightly differently. So before we go further, let's talk about a problematic case. If omega equals zero in the case of this sync function, or if t equals zero in the case of this function, we have an indeterminate form of zero over zero. We ran into something similar when we looked at the Fourier series of a square wave, and that's not a coincidence that we ran into something similar there, but we'll deal with that mostly in a future lecture. So like when we looked at Fourier series, we have a couple of ways of dealing with this. One of them is to use L'Hopital's rule. So let's start with the sync function on the left here. So the question we wanna ask on the left is what is the limit of all of this stuff here as t approaches zero? So again, L'Hopital's rule requires some conditions to hold in order for it to work. If those conditions don't hold, you can still blindly apply the form of L'Hopital's rule and get a number, but that number doesn't mean anything. In this class, all of the stuff, we're going to apply L'Hopital's rule. I promise L'Hopital's rule will work. We won't need to worry about it further. So in this case, we'll have omega naught coming out of the chain rule from taking the derivative of the sine, cosine omega naught t, and then in the denominator, we'll just have pi. So taking the limit as t goes to zero in this case, well, the cosine will go to one, so this will give us omega naught over pi. Now let's look at the case on the right. So on, in the right, let's see what happens to this expression here in the limit as omega goes to zero. So in this case, in the numerator, we'll have L over two popping out from the chain rule of taking the derivative. Again, we'll have a cosine L over two omega from taking the derivative, and then we'll have a one over two sitting here in the denominator. As omega goes to zero, this cosine will go to one, the twos here will wind up canceling, and I'll just be left with L. Let's check this another way and see if it makes sense. <laughs> On the left here, it looks like I'm taking the limit of a chili pepper. Do they have yellow peppers? I guess we could take the limit of a yellow pepper, or maybe that's taking the limit of a banana. I don't know. Anyway. Okay, to try to get a handle on this, let's just rewrite our forward and inverse Fourier transforms. And in particular, let's look at the special case where we plug in zero. So for the forward transform, we would wind up with this exponent turning into one because e to the zero is one, and we're just left with the integral of the function. So this resembles something that we saw with the zeroth Fourier series coefficients back when we were looking at Fourier series. Similarly, if I want to figure out what I get from the inverse transform formula when I plug in zero for t, so I wind up with one over two pi 
the integral of the Fourier transform. So let's see what that means in the context of what we have above here. Well, what's the integral of this function? Well, this is just a rectangle. Forgot to draw it in, but it's got a height of 1. So I have something with a width of L, a height of 1, and L times 1, that's the area of the rectangle, that equals L. Remember, integral is a signed area, so if this had stuff that was negative, it would subtract that out. But here it's equal to L, so that's what we have over here. Okay, so what about the t equals 0 case? Well, let's see what we have here on the right. I have another rectangle, but now I have a height of 1 times a width of 2 omega naught going from here to here. But I also need to remember divide by 2 pi. That's a special thing that I get over here. And in this case, the 2's cancel, and I'm left with omega naught over pi. So everything here matches up. All right, let's see if we can get a handle on what these functions look like. The function on the top will have an omega axis, and the function on the bottom here will have a time axis. So we'll mark what we might call the DC value in frequency land, and we'll mark the origin in time land. So we just showed using either L'Hopital's rule or an argument based on simplifying the Fourier transforms for specific zero cases that the sinc function in terms of omega that we computed has L at zero. And then for the sinc function in terms of T, we said this was omega naught divided by pi. So if we look at the rest of the structure of these functions, we have an omega or a T sitting here in the denominator. And what that's going to do is it's going to give us a slope off as a function of 1 over the horizontal axis variable. The other players here are the sine functions. So let's take a look at those. This sine function is going to be 0 whenever L omega over 2, the argument of the sine function, is equal to some integer multiple, let's call it k, of pi. We could write that the zero crossings occur at omega equal 2 pi k divided by L. Down here for the time function, similarly, we'll ask where is omega naught t equal to some integer multiple of pi, which will give us t equal k pi over omega naught. Okay, so the zero crossings in this case will land at 2 pi over L, 4 pi over L, 6 pi over L, 8 pi over L, and then you would have a similar set of zero crossings here on the other side. For the time domain function, the zero crossings would land at pi over omega naught, 2 pi over omega naught, 3 pi over omega naught, 4 pi over omega naught, and similarly we would have the negative values over this direction like minus pi over omega naught. Up here I'll write minus 2 pi over L, and you can fill in the rest of these yourself if you are so inclined. So now I will try to make what will probably not be a fairly successful attempt to sketch a sinc function. You'll have a set of side lobes that alternate positive and negative, and that decrease in height with an increase in omega, or as we would draw it down here, as an increase with t. The sinc function is symmetric. Notice if you put a negative sign in here, that negative sign would pull out of the sign and would cancel with a negative sign sitting here in the denominator. So this is symmetric, which makes sense because we know the functions that we're taking the Fourier transform of are real valued, and real valued functions have conjugate symmetry, which means that the real parts must be symmetric, and in this case we don't have any imaginary component. That's an important observation to make because in general, Fourier transforms are complex valued, so it wouldn't really make sense to draw something that goes both positive and negative here. It works here because we don't have any imaginary values. In general, if your Fourier transforms have a complicated angle, you would just plot the magnitudes. So here that would be like taking all of these negative going sections of the graph and drawing them going up the other direction. To get a little bit of intuition of how sinc functions operate, in particular where the zero crossings are, remember what this was the Fourier transform of. Imagine that you had a linear time invariant system with an impulse response that was one of these boxcar functions. Now this would be fairly difficult to impossible to actually build in practice. This might be something that you might be able to approximate well using digital signal processing, but you would be very hard pressed to the point of not being able to do it if you want to build something out of resistors, capacitors, inductors, and or op amps to implement this.
But let's go ahead and think about it. What these zero crossings represent, these represent the frequencies where you have a nice integer number of waveforms sitting inside this averaging operation. So if you imagine doing the convolution and taking this boxcar and flipping and shifting it, you would see that as it's sliding along, as parts of the sinusoid that it's intersecting over here are added to the integral, the parts that are canceling it over here are disappearing from the integral, so it all stays balanced. So at all of these other values of omega, those correspond to sinusoids where you may have some positive going and negative going lobes canceling each other out, but you'll wind up having some that doesn't get canceled, and that's what's getting through here. And also notice the further out you go in frequency, you'll have a case with these positive and negative going lobes cancel out, and the tiny little sliver that's left over here at the end, that's what's sort of leaking through here. So let's think about where this function shows up. This is the impulse response of an ideal low-pass filter, which would eliminate all of the frequencies above omega naught. This might be a thing that we would want to build. There's a lot of applications where we might want to build such a device. However, what our analysis here shows is that it is impossible to build such a device. First of all, notice this impulse response goes all the way up to infinity and nobody has an infinite amount of time. But from a more practical matter, look at all of this stuff down here for t less than zero. So if a system's not linear time invariant, it can be very tricky to figure out whether it's causal or not, if it's some weird puzzle a professor made up. But if you have a linear time invariant system, then that system is causal if and only if h of t is zero for t less than zero. So all of the stuff up here in your impulse response, all of this stuff is fine, but all of the stuff down here is a problem. So the impulse response of an ideal low-pass filter is non-causal. It needs to look infinitely into the future. Therefore, it's not something you can actually build. That said, we're going to use things like this, ideal low-pass filters, a lot in our analysis because you can go spend some money and potentially build something reasonably close. Using this ideal low-pass filter in our analysis is good enough to get us in the ballpark of understanding how things are operating. So notice that this here is not causal either because of all the stuff here less than zero. Let's play around with an alternative impulse response. Let's call it h of tilde just to have something else to call it. Suppose we had a function that started at zero and ended at l. This would be perfectly causal. Sometimes students will get confused because they'll say, oh, well, t bigger than zero, that must be the future. But no, remember, if you think about flipping and shifting for a second, remember, once you flip this, it's obvious then you're looking into the past. So if you wanted to know what the Fourier transform of this is, it's not terribly hard. I can take the base Fourier transform of a rectangle of length L and then use the shift property. So to go from here to here, I would have to shift to the right by L over two. So, and I know that shifting in time corresponds to multiplication by a complex exponential in frequency, e to the minus j omega L over two. And there you go.